This conference will now be recorded. Good afternoon, everybody. It's indeed a great pleasure to invite and welcome all of you to this uh, Meet the Expert Let Us Discuss Biodiversity Forum. It's a, a great opportunity to interact with one of our today's expert, very young, dynamic scientist of Geological Survey of India with us, Dr. Lalit Kumar Sharma. Dr. Lalit Sharma, welcome to this forum. And it uh, gives me immense pleasure to introduce uh, the forum, Dr. Lalit Kumar Sharma. Uh, Dr. Lalit Sharma is a, a um, capable wildlife biologist with more than 15 years of experience in various agro pastoral and ecological zones covering fragile ecosystems of India with leading research and conservation organizations of the country such as WIA Dehradun, ICFRE Dehradun, FRA Dehradun, World Bank New Delhi, etc. And uh, he is a well-trained GIS and remote uh, sensing personnel with JDSI. He had uh, also experience with several statistical softwares and wildlife techniques. Uh, to the best of his credit, he is having more than uh, 35 research publications in peer reviewed journals. Besides that, uh, many uh, popular articles and abstract in international national journals. To his recognition, I can say he is one of the member of IUCN SC Beer Human Complete Export Group, member of International Beer Association, member of Wildlife Society, member of British Ecological Society, World overview of conservation approaches and technology he is also a member to that lead fellow of the year 2016-17 member of global forest fire network and representative of indian chapter in that he has visited several countries including spain taiwan canada nepal bhutan germany switzerland etc and when we talk about biodiversity wildlife science or um, taxonomy normally we deal with classical things and the modern approach really changes its value so uh, uh, we need to combine both young and uh, old mind together so that we can have a better output to our research and when we come to know about these uh, particular aspects of uh, science uh, before going to our data collection or uh, before going to the real scientific approach we can have a better approach of collecting data better approach towards uh, uh, the biodiversity database or better approach towards the thing what we exactly want to do so it uh, gives me immense pleasure to hand over this forum now to dr lalit kumar sharma uh, dr lalit sharma now the forum is all yours please go ahead and enlighten us uh, with the topic on using gis and remote sensing in funnel studies please dr sharma go ahead thank you very much i hope i'm audible sir yes doctor i hope i'm audible, audible sir yeah, 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 Doctor. You are thank right. you very much, sir. Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving us, giving me this opportunity to interact with this uh, gathering. And uh, I would say that Corona has created a lot of problem, but uh, it has given us a lot of opportunities. And this is an example that uh, we can discuss through, uh, I mean, topics which are very important in the in the contemporary world. And uh, like for example, uh, remote sensing in GIS in phonistic uh, studies. Uh, uh, we know that in ZSI we are doing a lot of funnel investigations. Uh, we are we are doing ecological studies. Many aspects of animals we are covering. But the thing is that uh, uh, we need to be uh, you know uh, accompanied with uh, some of the most robust and uh, latest techniques and methods which are available, which can actually enhance our product at the end. Like we know that uh, remote sensing in GIS is uh, have been used by many departments. Many people are you know using this, and of course, like for example, in for monitoring COVID-19, uh, there are now portals are available, global portals are available, which are now you know uh, you know helpful in mitigating the impacts. Also, most recently, I have seen some publications where COVID-19 uh, you know vulnerability has been assessed by some good groups of America and also in China. Those are some very nice publications, which which indicates that GIS remote sensing have a lot of scope and it can be applied in each and every aspect, starting from developmental projects, environmental impact studies, wildlife studies, or you know, phonistic studies, 
even in defense services also nowadays we are using it you know about the recent problem which has happened in La in La Ladakh where you know even the remote sensing if the satellite data are used for you know understanding whether the Chinese are there in our borders or not like that so uh, uh, in this uh, interaction I will be more focused on how uh, we can use remote sensing and GIS in quantistic studies how can we how can we enhance our capabilities for you know documenting animals uh, of this spatial uh, to the spatial extent of the country which is such a big area uh, we have so many biogeographical zones and provinces ecosystems uh, and it is very difficult to you know document all uh, animals from these uh, ecosystems without uh, uh, manually we have been doing this since our 100, 100 years but it's still such a such a knowledge gap is available still which need to be fulfilled and i think remote sensing in gis can play a very important role in this so uh, i will straight away go to the the presentation which uh, basically i prepared for this and uh, as, as anil sir has already told me that this is a mixed group uh, where i expect a very uh, beginner who, who might be a graduate student and there are professors also teachers and university scientists all those kind of people are there so i prepare the presentation in such a way that each and everyone can get a message which is specific to that particular you know uh, stakeholder who is present today so now I'm going to, uh, uh, if you shall allow me to, uh, uh, you know, uh, for making this presentation. Yeah, already allowed, already allowed. I had made you already presenter. Just share your screen. My Just camera. Moment, sir. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, it is there, okay. So, uh, yeah, the PPT is uh, visible right now. Yeah, yeah, PPT is coming probably. Your screen is visible now. Oh, okay. Yeah, PPT is coming. Yeah, it's perfect. Please go ahead. Okay. So the title is basically using remote sensing in GIS uh, in quantistic studies. Uh, as the sir, sir has already given me, given the introduction about me, what basically I am and where I am working. Uh, I am doing this wildlife research and using remote sensing in GIS since last many years. And it is it is a useful uh, tool which can be utilized. That's why I'm here to share with you guys. So uh, uh, in this presentation, there are several aspects which I'm going to cover. and uh, I will be very brief in uh, the first three things, which is basically GPS and fundamentals of GIS and fundamentals of MAP. And then the fourth component is use of GIS in quantistic studies. How basically I have used and how the uh, you know participants of this particular interaction can use this. This is used for study designing for you know designing a study for conducting a quantistic study. So you need to know that how we can design and how GIS can help in designing the studies. Then there are distribution modeling, which are species distribution modeling, which are range distribution modeling, and then also habitat, uh, you know, suitable habitat identification uh, strategies. Then species distance assessment, you can assess the uh, species distance using the GIS remote sensing, uh, using the GIS data. Then, sorry, climate change impact assessment. This is a very growing area where we need to know how the climate change is actually going to impact our species ecosystems and so that we can develop an adaptive strategy to combat that and mitigate and get an develop an ad adaptation mechanic mechanism for that then also the forest fire impact studies uh, forest fire is a very important uh, uh, area and today in the indian uh, contemporary world and uh, we need to know that where the forest fire is happening we need to Sharma, hello india Thank you, sir. Hello. Sir, any, uh, Anil, sir, is there any problem? Uh, hello. Water patient, Julie. Hello. Hello. Thanks, sir. Hello. I'm audible, sir. Doctor, you, are, you please go ahead. You are perfect. Okay. Okay. So then uh, we there are uh, issues related to geospatial funnel repositories. Nowadays, there are geospatial repositories are also available. 
where you know uh, based on the citizen science data and a lot of researchers which are working in the entire world they are actually submitting you know uh, their data set which is available for you know for uh, meta analysis then in landscape ecological studies we can do using the remote sensing in gis also the population genetics uh, rather i would say population uh, uh, landscape genetics basically we where we can utilize our GIS and remote sensing, uh, you know, capabilities. So first of all, I will just just say an introduction about the GPS. You all must be knowing that this is an instrument which is required. Without this, we cannot do all this GIS and remote sensing. We know that this is the uh, instrument uh, navigation system, which is basically developed by the U.S. Uh, Department of Defense. And there are, uh, like for example, recently China has also developed their own. You know, a uh, system uh, for doing this navigation, and also government of India is also planning, or they are maybe in the coming future we will be having our own navigation system. So this is presently that we are using, and we know that there are several models of GPS are available, uh, starting from the GPS 72 that now nowadays we are using Oregon 650 or maybe better than that. Uh, we know that there are 24 satellites which are always always you know orbiting the Earth's surface, and using those satellites. We uh, we get this information, the location, very uh, the position of, of wherever we are present, and also of course the time and uh, the accuracy. These GPS uh, uh, satellites are basically monitored in different places, and we know that the the Colorado Center, which is basically located here, is the place where it is basically from where the master control is there. You know, the entire system of GPS are basically handled from here. Then, uh, as I said, these are a very uh, important instrument which is which provide an accurate navigation, which is used for uh, maybe in shipping industry, people are using it and several people are using it. Even today uh, in our mobile also, we are using GPS, the Google Earth by which you know you can find the right uh, tracks and you can locate yourself and you can you can get directions to the place. This is all basically because of the GPS and the remote sensing. Then it is the, the 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 important thing. Other useful important thing is that it is 24 hour accessible and this provides a common coordinate system. You know there are a lot of coordinate systems and projection systems. I am not going to uh, discuss those things because uh, these are more uh, you know uh, uh, more sophisticated one. But just just to tell that you know we are using the UTM uh, coordinate system and there are geographical light long coordinate system. There are so many types of but we should basically use that. UTM, which is basically used by globally, so that we can, we can you can compare your data set with other people also. And uh, 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 this is all about the very basic things about the GPS. How uh, well, GPS? Uh, this is you know, here in the picture. You can see how you uh, the GPS get GPS location. And uh, whenever when we were in field, we I mean when I was doing my research, I was told that uh, the the best way to uh, uh, you know, use your GPS uh, is that that whenever you go in a field site, new field site, you keep your GPS look, look, uh, GPS open for some time, for maybe for hour and hour like that, so that you know you can acquire the more precise locations and you you can get a good GPS location. There will not be errors in that. Of course, there are obstacles like cloud cover. There are trees, so. So again, those obstacles can be rectified by averaging the locations. So for example, whenever you are in field, you have taken the GPS location and you are getting an accuracy of, uh, like for example, 25 meters. Uh, that I that is that is not considered a good accuracy. Uh, we suggest that it should be better. It should be that less than 10. Uh, so for that reason, we we take 10 GPS location and then we average uh, from the area and then we can get a, a precise value. Then after the fundamentals of map, uh, we know you must have seen this kind of a uh, map. This is a contour map which basically talks about how the elevation contours are distributed in the area. And there are, you must have seen the scales which is provided here, the pine scale and the coarser scale which are provided here. Uh, and then uh, in, a, uh, in a map, what basically is there are major seven uh, components that are like, for example, the map body, the entire map body, the layout of the map, then there's a title. There are insert map from, for example, uh, I am I am working in the uh, Himalayas where the Himalaya is located. Maybe in Himalaya in Gangotri National Park where the Gangotri National Park is located in Himal Himalayas. And then we can know the title the scale. The north arrow is very much important. And then then the, uh, preview map which is here available here, and the scale of the map. And if these components are there, then it is it is qualified to be called as map. And Everybody can use it, and there will be no problem in uh, uh, you know using that those kinds of maps. 
there are basic principles of designing a map, which is the first one. First of all, we should know what is the purpose for what basic reason that we are making the map. Then audience, we need to know to whom basically we are making the map. So based on that, you know, audience capability, we also have to decide, you know, uh, the maps uh, sophisticatedness. For example, uh, if we are going to make more complicated one, so many information is available, like a general civilian or, or a common uh, stakeholder or, or village community cannot understand that. So that uh, that's why it is important that we should know the audience to whom that we are making the map. Then scale and size, as is, as I already said, scales and size are very important. Uh, uh, then uh, what is the focus where basically uh, you are focusing on, like for example, in a map where you are going to implement your studies, that area should be basically in focus and integrity, of course, your data is basically you are presenting in a map, it should be uh, validated, there should not be error so that uh, anybody can you know, re repeat the study in the same area and then you have a balance. Uh, balance is very important. It's not like that only one thing is highlighted, of course, everything has to be provided in such a way that it looks like very good and it should not look like very clumsy. And completeness, I said that there are all seven components has to be there in the map. So this is all about uh, about the GPS and map. And in this is uh, uh, the other important thing is that cartography. Cartography, uh, I don't know whether you might be knowing that during our childhood, uh, we have seen the cartographers. Like in revenue departments, uh, there are cartographers which are, you know, uh, since I, 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 I'm son of a, uh, you know, agriculture family, I have seen this that, that uh, that there are land reports which are basically you know mapped by the cartographers in the tessils so nowadays uh, that particular art has gone in that way uh, but now sophisticated techniques are available where you can use these kinds of instruments and you can digitize but now does uh, of course this is, has also become uh, absolute now uh, we can use it we can then scan the map and we can digitize it using the gis softwares so uh, cartography is the most important aspect when uh, when you are making the map and anybody who's, who calls, calls himself a cartographer must be knowing all those things that basically I've said. So uh, these are uh, several types of maps. Uh, there are basically basic maps uh, basically we use in the, uh, in the study area. Then there are thematic maps, which are basically product maps. Most of you might have seen on Bhuvan, on Bhuvan database of uh, NRSC, there are thematic maps which are available. The, these are basically product maps of uh, different particular themes. Uh, under the basic maps, we we know we need to know the topography. Uh, we, we need to know the radar image images. Then there are aerial photographs. Nowadays, these aerial, aerial photographs have been replaced by UV. Um, I mean, uh, these drone-based photographers. Then satellite data that basically we use. And under the thematic maps, there are sort of uh, several types of thematic maps, which is, which, is, uh, which is required, can be created, which can be a social, sociological map, economic map, an agriculture map, or land use map, or different kinds of maps which can be developed under this category. Now, the thing which is very important for which that basically we are here to discuss GIS, Geographical Information System. This is a, a new and robust technique, basically, which is basically used to analyze map data uh, with, respect to, with reference to geographical pers uh, perspective. So there are, you must have seen these kinds of layers of, uh, like, for example, customer, street, and parcel, elevation, land use. So many types of layers can be created. Uh, this is basically because of the GIS. And uh, 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 it is a very sophisticated and, uh, you know, technique which is now available uh, where we have a data of different types basically two of them are like vector data and raster data vectors are basically uh, are in the form of gps points and it can be a form of a polygon it can be a line raster is having something which has got a uh, some dn value digital uh, digital value is there basically with each and every pixel so pixels are having some values but in this case these are basically three types plots uh, points lines and polygons so uh, if you see the uh, uh, parts, basically there are six components of a, GP, of a GIS system. There are people who, who work, like, work on maps, like for example, I, I work on map and I am discussing with Dr. Animal Mahapatra and one of my colleagues that how we can design a study, then we need to have a software that we have a data, the ancillary data which is required, the basic maps are required, then we can, uh, procedure is required, that what procedure should adopt, that I will discuss today, how we can do that. Then hardware, hardware is the most important thing that where all the software and data had to put, then based on this networking, we can design a GIS product. Uh, the examples of spatial data, which 
is basically the for example no networks of there are vegetation in ventries of like forest survey of india they do forest cover and forest density forest type uh, mapping and there are more data sets also where you can use where you can get this different kind of vegetation layers there are soil inventories uh, we know in dehradun there is an institute called uh, icr institute is doing responsibility to generate information on soil and water resources they provide soil data and then there is another institute called nbsslup in nagpur they are also providing a lot of information on land cover and those kinds of things and then there are census information which is now available in the you know you know geospatial platform then the boundaries or ancillary the data elevation values climate reading all sort of data is available here you can see there are this is a population density map of india likewise there are certain like these are the major water basins uh, which are there in the indian subcontinent like that now the you uh, we use of we uh, example where we use gis and more sensing recently in zsi we have done a project for government of india this is related to the uh, the bullet train which is basically uh, have to be the Uh, you know, developed uh, which has to. Uh, uh, there is a uh, tunnel network has to be developed for a particular uh, bullet. So in Mumbai, uh, there is a place called Thane where the bullet train has to pass uh, under the creek. So for uh, understanding that, uh, what will be the possible ecological environmental impacts? So we need. We were given an assignment to assess the area. So for that reason, we designed a study. So where to sample and how to sample? This is basically has to be done by remote sensing GIS. Earlier. people are using uh, use, using the uh, cartographic maps but now uh, we have technology we can use this so we designed a study like for example we created 1 by 1 km or 2 by 2 km grid sampling grids and these sampling grids are systematically sampled like for example here you can see the grid codes so uh, i know where i have to sample these grid sample grids has to be sampled there are centroids of all these grids from there some sampling has to be done like that So another example uh, of a GIS is uh, like, for example, a large scale implementation of studies, a large scale projects. Like most recently, uh, I have been assigned in a project under the National Mission of Himalayan Studies, where uh, where where we implemented a project on the on a spatial scale of five different states, and there are six different uh, large uh, districts which where we have sampled. So, uh, like for example, Lahore Spiti is one of the state, uh, one of the district which is in our study. so the project is of 3 years and i don't know a uh, laul species area is about 13000 square kilometer and it's not possible to go each and every corner of laul spiti how will i be decide that so where to go where not to go so for that reason gis based uh, support is required so using the gis remote sensing and the field uh, you know uh, inventory data i just categorize the area into two intensive study area and extensive study area intensive study area is that area where i am uh, putting more repetitive sampling and more repetitive uh, camera trapping like for example the national tiger uh, assessment uh, pro program where camera traps are put in tiger reserves which are having some areas where where tiger occupancies are basically documented and uh, for doing that uh, for identifying the areas where camera trap has to be put there there are occupancies are well done by uh the forest department and the researchers and uh, and by that information only the team could be able to decide where to put camera traps so for intensive studies and of course the intensive extensive information also has to be gathered and based on this we can you know we can develop information on current distribution we can we can design our human wildlife conflict studies also uh by selecting a village using cluster approach or cluster approach in a grid approach or whatever like that then we can identify the zones and then of course based on the this particular strategy we can also provide to the government that what are the management recommendations as per the zones and we can uh, as per the categories also this is an example uh, how the grid has uh, have grid based design have helped me you know uh, designing the study for example lahul spiti you have so many grids that uh, but most major is basically empty because here you can see this is a most here the forest cover a forest type map of uh, of the area and most of the area is devoid of forest so i can decide uh, how much area of this particular type where there is no forest so uh, how many grids should i sample in this and representatively uh, systematically i can decide you uh, know each and every site which grid i which how many grid i have to sample which can tell me the entire you know uh, composition of the species in the area
that is how the argument uh, use uh, which will be more focused in this presentation is basically the focus thing we know that species distribution modeling is an important uh, tool which is now uh, uh, become very prominently prominent in publications so many papers are coming coming, uh, coming on daily basis in this particular uh, by using this particular tool so let me tell you friends that we should know that a species distribution model is a more sophisticated strategy for uh, you know assessing the species distribution and we should know that what basically we are going to model and how to uh, we we have to model is not like that there are default options that are available you just go and just click them and then you get a, get an output so uh, if there are uh, those kind of models we say that is a garbage in and garbage out if we do not know why that particular parameter has been used and uh, how this particular parameters actually impact the species ecology or behavior then it become a garbage only it's just a garbage in and garbage out so let me tell you friend in this presentation i will discuss about how we decide that what what particular thing has to be taken up for modeling so uh, models are basically of three types like when we we are actually uh, in the uh, in the process of developing the ranges of the species you might be knowing there are certain species there are many species for this uh, for them we do not know the ranges we do not know the area of occurrence and the area area of occupancy for that reason we can we you can uh, use the sdm for you know developing the uh, uh, ranges and under the ranges uh, we can uh, find we can find out the fundamental risks and the uh, realized risks and under the, this uh, uh, fundamental risks risks are basically uh, a special pattern of a environmental suitable for occupancy of a given taxa uh, and this is basically considered geographical space or environmental component this is basically the entire distribution of the uh, of the species here, here you can see the uh, the green color is basically telling about the distribution of the species and then the red color is the one which is basically realized this is the area which is uh, used by the species very intensively and um, uh, uh, very precisely and this can be calculated and so now it is clear there are basically sdms uh, can be done at three scales and species range distribution and habitat uh under the species uh, we we under the range we we say that it is very easy because like for example uh, iucn ssc groups are assessing the species they say that the range of the species is this sometimes that group of about 10 15 uh, you know senior experienced professionals of that particular taxa they decide that this is the range when the information is not available uh, very precisely this this uh, this uh, strategy can be used and then and it is uh, then you go to the next level this is called distribution where uh, it is more uh, little more, you know more difficult one require data intensive data sampling and there are statistical algorithms gis models are available where you can you know uh, which you can be uh, which can be implemented for you know uh, providing the species distribution then third is basically this is a more sophisticated one where this is based on the real time data for example somebody do the habitat ecology studies on some certain species some landscape so more precise or uh, strategy is this and it is of basically uh, uh, you know localized information is basically uh, used by researchers uh, you know for developing the habitat suitability map and there are observations we know that raw data whenever we go in sample in a certain area like for example these red points are basically point locations point distributions and uh, Earlier, these distribution points are used for de defining the ranges, but nowadays uh, we do not accept it that way. But just a record only. Uh, of course, there are limitations of, of using this uh, point data for describing the species distribution. This is an example of uh, of, our, of our recent publication. This talks about the distribution range of a a species of primate, a primate species called Himalayan langur, where we have modeled the species. The green color is the area which is basically the area which is having suitable areas of the species. And these are the polygons. The black color are the polygons uh, representing the protected areas. Here you can see there are this particular species not only lives in protected area, but of course you can see this, this species outside the protected area. So uh, now uh, there are uh, two main approaches for, uh, you know, for uh, distribution assessment, distribution studies. So one is the inductive, where uh, where we uh, we use some uh, occupancy based data and uh, using uh, and using un under the influence of certain variables, predictor variables, and then we model into a uh, you know multivariate uh, uh, algorithm like for example Maxent, and there are so many which are available. Uh, and then another one is the inductive. Inductive uh, inductive uh, way is basically 
uh, we take GPS records and, and we, uh, we, we use some sort of uh, extrapolation. Like for example, this is an example. Uh, here you can see this is a deductive uh, inductive one inductive one this is a forest uh, fire density map fire density map of the country of 2016 so what we have done the uh, gps locations of the entire country was downloaded from uh, 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 was downloaded from the portal uh, modis portal sorry modis portal and uh, we have ex uh, you know extrapolated and uh, interpolated and then we developed the inductive man and then then this is uh, Deductive one, which is in a product of a geospatial uh, modeling, means that species distribution modeling, where we have used qualitative data, presence records, and uh, using the environmental variables, we model the species. Uh, uh, there are uh, other than important things, which is the most important thing, uh, which is the slide is presenting, is the occurrence data. We we should know the quality and quantity. Somebody uh, says that, uh, you know, how much locations are required for us uh, doing the species distribution model. It is pretty, uh, you know, a uh, tricky question. You cannot uh, say that so many locations are required for doing the SDM. But uh, we should know that uh, the most important thing is that how the locations or the occurrence locations are distributed in the range of the species. Are these uh, very clumsy or they are some uh, clusters that are coming out or they are spread very well? then we can decide if there are spreads are quite well means there is no spatial autocorrelation among them as per the data the variables that we have used for modeling the species because we need to know like for example if we are move, uh, if you are modeling the species at one kilometer by one kilometer grid size so you should have an autocorrelation of one or one more than one uh, kilometer otherwise there will be a lot of spatial uh, uh, you know correlation and you will be getting more of a, a you know very false positive uh, results in the product so uh, for quality and quantity it should be uh, you must be knowing that there are systematic surveys there are opportunistic surveys so what kind of data you are using you can decide here then there are limited data or this is very abundant like for example recently i worked on a species called hangul which is uh, very uh, you know uh, distributed in only one area and uh, and the entire distribution range of the species is not more than thousand square kilometer so uh, it is very uh, uh, you know obvious that you are going to get a lot of spatial correlation between the locations and because it's a group of only 100 150 individuals left today and uh, if you have records and they must be you know very close so you should you should model that uh, if you want to model this species then you require a more uh, you know precise data maybe the grid size should be very so small it should not be one kilometer like that maybe of 10 meter or 20 meter that data has to be generated for uh, modeling the species then the third thing is basically presence only or the presence absence sometime we have presence only data of the species and which is most uh, you know uh, often be used by the researchers and then uh, there are presence and absence which is like for example camera trap data which you provide for example, you are conducting the camera type survey in an area very systematically and you cover the entire grids and you know that where the species is present and not present. So based on that data, we, we can model the species. And the most important thing where, while uh, you know, before going into the modeling uh, uh, algorithm, you should know that uh, whether you have uh, you have checked the data, it means that uh, the data has, doesn't have a special correlation or not, or these locations are very precise or there are there are issues, seasonal issues, or, or, or all that side of all those sort of uh, information has to be, you know, uh, very uh, corrected and filtered. And using then after you should go to the next step, which is basically the modeling data. We know there are influence element, uh, uh, which basically influence the distribution of a species. The most important uh, are basically the ecology and behavior. So whatever species that you are modeling, you should know the ecology, the basic ecological requirements, habitat ecology of the species, and the behavioral. Uh, behavioral understanding of the species then there are and then the other uh, important thing uh, yeah, when we started modeling the species uh, we were basically told that we should take uh, as much as much variable are which are available uh, for for modeling but this is not true uh, we, we have to decide you know like say, for example you have a data set uh, you know, I mean, you have a variables of like, for example, 35 variables, environmental variables you have for predicting the species. So you should not take all these 35 variables. You should again go for any special, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, correlation analysis among them, and then and whatever which is special independent, 
which is not having a linear relationship with other other parameter should be used so they they say that the fewer variables better than more because we know that the most uh, uh, influencing parameter we know that then there is no need to go uh, use the other sets which are not very important so fewer variables ideally uh, uh, they say that at least 10 to 12 uh, 10 parameters are more enough if you have uh, which are representing everything like topography or behavioral uh, behavior and ecology of the species of course the climate of or climatic uh, isotherm of the area and then uh, then use those uh, data set like for example here you can see the climate or you know physical parameters uh, climate terrain soil and then biotic composition and using those parameters as a, as a predictor variables you can model the species so there are so many uh, distribution modeling approaches which are available uh, that, like for example go back in 1990s there were Time when people were using NPI and there are domain uh, similarity matrices, there are rule based models which are available. There are envelope models or like bioclaim or anuclaims which are very traditionally have been used. And even though, uh, like this, nowadays, Maxon models are people are using. But uh, I would say that uh, I personally feel that uh, whenever uh, we use a model, we should know that what particular algorithm is working behind that model. If you do not know that on what particular method Maxon works, then there is no point to utilize that model and uh, you will not be able to understand it you may give some conclusions but i don't know what will be the reliability of that conclusions and there are certain other models are which are available nowadays and there is something called a ensemble approach or classical statistics uh, ensemble approach where you use all set of models like for example glm gl uh, gam logistic regression uh, you know uh, you know random forest and there are a max end where all sets of you know uh, different models are put together and you make an ensemble out of all those five six so that is considered to be the most robust one nowadays this artificial neural network based also models are also available and the most uh, you know the updated uh, biomode 2 uh, biomode 2 is one of the uh, programs which is available in r which is which provides an opportunity to model the species uh, using the ensemble approach and uh, friends, let me also tell you about that. Nowadays, there are cloud-based modeling uh, platforms are available where you can model the species. If you do not have a computer which has uh, have a good RAM, means your computational power is not good. You can also adopt the cloud-based computer uh, computation which are available. These are example outputs of some distribution models which are developed by different uh, uh, you know strategies. Uh, here you can see the GAM, GLM. The same data might be presented differently. Somebody will, uh, some some model will give you more uh, precise answers sometime, and another model will give you very false positive area. So over prediction is a very serious issue. So for rectifying that that over prediction issue in your model, the ensemble model is suggested, and uh, we should go for ensemble model rather than doing the maximum modeling. This is an example uh, how we have done the species this is called still called uh, in, uh, you know uh, indian gray langur which we have modeled in the genetic plane in the chota nagpur area uh, using the set of variables and we published this paper in 2019 in class one and after modeling the species distribution we also have generated the biological corridors of the species so this is another strategy after modeling if somebody is interested to understand the biological or wildlife corridors which we call very uh, popularly so uh, for what th that reason what you have to do that you have to use the uh, suitability product of uh, or habitat uh, your SDM and that SDM can be the suitability product can be used under the influence of some environmental parameters which are considered to be barriers for uh, for the species using the uh, you know circuit escape algorithm or there are certain other algorithms or methods are also available where you can uh, uh, which you can utilize for making the corridors here you can see the white color areas are the one which are connecting areas connecting between uh, connecting different areas they are the biological corridors uh you have developed model but the, the the other important thing how the model how much the reliable model is and what are the issues that we face model evaluation has to be done and how we have done the model evaluation of the commission where the mission errors are insufficient sample size if you have then it will be a serious problem then there are major measurement errors what kind of data that you have then insufficient spatial resolution as i said that like uh, if you if you do not understand the spatial resolution and you do not understand the home range you do not know the home range of any species 
then you need to match those those things then only you can predict very precisely or more robustly and then after you can validate the model uh, people are using uh, aic models and we suggest that tss uh, is the most suitable way to evaluate the model then after there are model selections uh, in ensemble uh, if you have suppose five types of species distribution model so you have to select uh, uh, what particular model have uh, performed very well so using the tss value you can make the rf of this maybe like the maximum number of models supporting the area which is predicted by all of the more areas so there should be some sort of a, uh, uh, you know commonness commonality of in prediction so there are certain areas which are basically common among the all four five five type of model that area can be you know used as a species distribution or or habitat suitability area of that particular species this is an example uh, uh, where we have used the climate change impact. As I said, climate change impact is a very important thing than uh, how the climate change impacts are visible. There are basically two ways. Uh, one is that uh, because of the climate change, species are shifting their ranges. And the other way is basically the species are contracting their ranges. There are species which are, basi which are basically very ecologically spacious species, like, for example, brown bears. They live in a very narrow range of distribution. Here you can see that the lowest elevation where you see the brown bear is about 3,200 meters, and maximum it can go to the 4,500 meters. So then the, the niche of this particular elevation, niche of this particular species is very narrow. If there will be some sort of a climatic aberration in this area, uh, means uh, there will be warming in the in the area where the species is distributed, it will definitely result in salt in the uh, result in uh, in sort of a uh, you know contraction of the species but if there is a species which is a generalist when like for example a, a common leopard or maybe some other species which is a generalist which has an opportunity to further go up like this is that the because of the climate change species are going up so what will happen to the brown bears like for example it is already at the maximum range that 4500 meter beyond that there is a permafrost area which is biologically uh, you know not possible to sustain this is the physi physiologically stress area so what will happen to those the species further they will not cannot they cannot climb further, further high to that so what will happen their ranges will be contracting this is we have recently published uh, of course this is not published but right now it is in uh, maybe soon which is published it is in press so we have simulated and tried to understand how the distribution ranges of the species of uh, Himalayan brown bear uh, will be impacted, whether it will be contracted or uh, whether it will be uh, shifting. So what we found that it will be basically uh, contracting more precisely. Of course, there will be shift in some certain areas. We also have seen that whether the protected areas which are there in Himalayas are sufficient to cater the need of conservation needs. So we have also evaluated that the representativeness of those protected areas for the conservation of Himalayan brown bear in that particular publication this is another uh, example of climate change impact that we published i said that in earlier slide that the current distribution range of, Hiva, of himalayan langur here you can see that the red color is the area where the himalayan langur is going to you know uh, it will be not suitable by 2020 2070 in climate change scenario the, the green color is the area where the species is going to shift so you can see how how the climate change is going to impact uh, the species much of the areas will be lost for the himalayan gray langur and not only the areas even we have seen the biological connectivity the pre the previous one is the uh, you know that green color one and the, the most uh, the re recent one is the uh, blue one you can see there is a shift in the connectivity among the patches also so we for uh, for this uh, it is quite evident that climate change is going to impact so uh, for we are into this studies kind this kind of studies because we also want to suggest to the government of india that there should be some adaptive strategies you know uh, to mitigating the climate change impacts so how we can do that we are coming up with some solutions uh, for the, from these publications also the another example is the thrips you might be knowing this is an insect group which is distributed throughout the country uh, this is considered to be a pest group majority of the species of this particular group are considered to be pests there are, of course there are pollinators also in this in, in this category but there are very prominent uh, you know uh, 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 you know species in this particular group which are leading to economic loss it is said by many researchers so what we thought let us see you know whether this a species is going to impact that much whether we have to utilize the resources for studying this study this particular taxa in future or not 
Like for example, priority has to be set. What particular species has to be studied? What taxa has to be studied? So that for that reason only we have assessed it. So we have not only assessed the entire country, but we have used the global data set. So what we found that you can see based on the ensemble approach, like that I said, there are four predictor models which are saying this red color one, that this is the area which is in red color, which is basically infested by thrips, which are which are which are not good for agriculture crop. Means there are the pest thrips basically. So what we have seen in the uh, again, this is publication we have submitted to the Nature Food. This is going going to uh, coming soon. And what we found that in 2050 and 2070, like for example, this in RCP20, the medium uh, uh, rate of emissions, you, here you can see the distribution change, how the species distribution change is happening. So if you go, if we just focused in 2070, uh, in at 84 and 85, uh, at 8.5 RCP, at the highest emission cat uh, category, you will see here, go back to the C, this particular side, you can see that India is full of the Tyson of terror right now. But uh, in 2070, this will be the situation. In 2050, this will be the situation. So we can prioritize our resources, like how, what particular taxa has to be focused for part, for particular research, studies. So now the the niches, which is basically going to be vacated by this particular taxa, will be acquired by other set of organisms. So what what are those species that are going to occupy this? So we said we can decide that. Let us think of you know changing our approach from this particular taxa to the other taxa which is going to occupy this particular species, uh, niche, which is basically left by the species for, for doing uh, your research invest uh, you know, investments. Then, then we say that adaptive strategy, that's why with an example of adaptive strategy, how we can plan. So uh, for designing an adaptive strategy, we can do the modeling. I said that there are basically several types of models and then habitat suitability models, and then basically the connectivity models. And after doing this uh, uh, models and predicting the surface for the future, we can uh, decide that what area also, uh, I mean, we can tell the state governments or government of India that these are the areas where the species is going to, be, you know, moving the coming, come, based on the come, climate change scenario. So what government can say that, what government can decide, like for example, we are not saying that area also has to be uh, covered into protected area, but certain amount of, you know, protection or habitat enhancement activities can be done in this area. Maybe that area can be, you know, so that the quality or future sustainability of that area can you know uh, sustain for the in the coming future to address the climate change issues. An example of this is the example which is uh, uh, which we have done for thrips uh, for the for the India only, where you can see in present scenario this is the kind of infestation of this particular taxa in, in 2050. What is going to happen? This is as I said that the scale of data, the pixel size of data is very important. If you go back. If you just remember the other slide, which I said that the entire world scale, so that was uh, looking like that the entire uh, much of the data will be losing the tips. But in the India scale, the, our data is having a uh, good pixel size, which you can see that this is how the species is going to disappear in 2050 and 2070. Then the other important use of GIS based species distribution modeling is basically to identification of conservation priority areas. You might be knowing that. Uh, government of India uh, have a target to develop, uh, you know, a certain amount of uh, protected areas in the country. Like, for example, 10 percent, 10 percent of the total geographical area has to be covered in the protected area. And apart from that, there are certain species which are uh, predominantly occurring in uh, non-protected areas. How we decide that if there is a species which is predominantly occurring in non-protected areas, but it is a conservation priority, it means that uh, this is the certain species as per the IOCN. How we can decide? For that reason, we we use the species distribution model, and we use the field data. That as I said, that more inductive data we will be used in this, and using using that data, we can uh, identify the conservation side. Like for example, here we have used GIS and of course the field camera type data. Based on that, we could able to identify the red color are the one which are which can be prioritized. So we are now in the position of the government of India that to the government of Himachal Pradesh that we are going to suggest some conservation areas, conservation community reserves in the particular areas for the conservation of Himalayan brown bear. Himalayan brown bear is one of the very, uh, you know, uh, certain species, although it is uh, least concerned in, in the IUCN because it is lumped with the false set of brown bear, which are very prominently distributed in Europe and America. But if you see at the subspecies level, the species population has gone down too much. We do not know this. And then most of the areas uh, we have lost. So for this particular area in Lahol, Lahol Valley of Himachal Pradesh, 
significant you know good size of uh, you know a suitable area which can be prioritized by the government of himachal pradesh for conservation of brown bears then the most uh, this is another important thing which i said that forest fire i have a project to study the impact of forest fires on animals which is again funded by the national mission of himalayan studies this is very important uh, we were coming to jadasai i was working with forest survey forest research institute at that time that is the time where i developed interest in understanding the forest fire i was involved in several activities related to the forest fire studies uh, on forest uh, uh, but that time uh, some parliamentary committee government of india's parliamentary committee came to uh, you know investigate the impact of forest fire in 2016 in uttarakhand and himachal pradesh because that is the year where the high uh, certain number, very uh, huge amount of forest was burned and then and fortunately i was also present in that committee committee meeting and what was uh, recommended by the committee was uh, you know presented in the rashtrapati rash 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 bhavan and the report says that the forest fire is basically uh, you know the impact is basically estimated in form of uh, some area burned and the quality area has to, i mean the amount of how much area is burned how much tree has lost and this is what basically estimated but there was no information available how much animals are basically uh, lost we do not know that that endemic species some species which are range restricted species of plants as well as animals might have lost we don't know so the national mission have the mission mission of malin studies have given me project to understand that i am into the process of this so uh, this map shows that uh, the high forest area then extreme uh, forest fire burning areas uh, based on 13 years we know the forest covers are uh, forest cover of the country is increasing uh, as per the forest survey of india but the most important thing is that it might be increasing in terms of forest cover but the quality of forest which is very represented by very dense canopy forest type which is not that much increasing you can see that as per the 2017 i said i said only 2.99 percent of the entire forest cover that we have is having very dense forest otherwise most of the forest fires uh, forests are basically in the medium dense and open sand open forest so the point is that we should basically focus on that is those areas which are basically falling in the dark green color you can see these are the areas which has to be uh, you know uh, conserved properly or the strategy has to be developed for mitigating the drivers which are impacting these areas we know that uh, forests are basically in uh, experiencing direct and indirect driver drivers and uh, these are some of the drivers uh, which are uh, basically underlying or the proximate causes of degradation of the forest areas and among them the red one is the forest fire which is basically impacting the forest of much of the india here you can see some figures from uh, forest uh, recurring forest fire which is occur in uttarakhand uh, about in 2016 1900 hectare of the forest was burned because of the forest fire and if you see the uh, 10 year data of forest fire uh, in uh, forest fire history you can see Mizoram and Manipur, most of the uh, northeastern states are having highest number of forest fire incidences. This is basically happening because of a lot of uh, doom cultivation is happening in this area. It's very difficult to differentiate uh, because the area which is, uh, the, which is utilized by the local communities for the doom cultivation belongs to communities also the forest land. So right belong to the community, the land is belong to the forest. So uh, it is happening it is looking like that forest is basically burning that's such in in that sense but of course the, this is because of the uh, zoom cultivation here i have done some uh, uh, spatial interpolation of uh, how the forest fire you know uh, the hot spots have changed over the years you can see that there are certain areas which are recurringly every year burning but there are certain areas which are burning not very not every year but after certain uh, certain days certain years like for example uh, in northeastern state uh, this is common phenomena every year and that is most because of the june cultivation but what is interesting apart from northeastern states if you see that 2002 2008 2012 2016 there are commonalities between the area like for example if you have forest fire area forest uh, very large number of forest fire in these areas you have a, a higher number of forest fire in urissa and Madhya Pradesh and this particular area so there is a commonality between these two areas if there is a more fire in uttarakhand you can presume that there will be going to be more fires in this particular part of the country also so this is basically because of the uh, because much of the areas in both of the places is rain rain fed rain fed area and and there are a lot of uh, dry situations when there is a dry situation and then less amount of precipitation and high temperature uh, which is having common situation in both of the areas the results in forest fire in this area and then uh, if you see the last four years uh, like 15 16 17 18 9 
these particular areas are actually burning every year uh, in the last four years so now this is a time that we we should we should have some strategy to mitigate we should have some strategy to combat this but otherwise what we are saying that we have good amount of forest we have been as in as, as a forestry student we study that uh, forests are very good uh, forest fires are very uh, useful in uh, you know sustaining the ecosystems but if they uh, if they, if they if they definitely they can uh, they can uh, they can play important role in uh, maintaining the ecosystem that we know that whatever forest that we have it is basically happened because of the uh, maybe the, some role has played by the this uh, forest fire as a disturbance uh, which is an natural phenomena but but it becomes an, a recurring phenomena which is un, uh, uncontrolled then this is going to be disastrous you must have seen recently in the last year in australia what has happened in this particular country but we don't know when it may be repeated in our in our country also but because it is evident that much of the area is burning now uh, uh, let me go to the, the other important thing basically uh, uh, which is a geospatial repository this is a global uh, biodiversity information facility where uh, you can find data records gps records of organisms studied by uh, by many professionals throughout the country india is also one of the member of this and if you just you know, what you have to do just have to create your gps your your what you call your login id and you can download what's your data occurrence all data set which is available uh, with the gbi for example here you can see i did a filter with the country india and i just trying to know the mammals distribution the polygon these circles are representing the gps locations if you just zoom into that there will be thousands and thousands of the locations which are basically uh, making these red colors you can see there are so many locations so many locations are available which are selected with coordinates in from india means these are the mammalian records so this is uh, a useful data set for doing species distribution studies then uh, there is one thing called ibat uh, which is recently uh, uh, i think in 2018 it has been started uh, it is a consortium of iucn and uh, world resource institute i think the uh, nature conservancy also like four or five organizations uh, have developed this uh, uh, data set which is uh, which is also available in a special form like for example i have uh, downloaded uh, there is suppose i have selected a honeycomb grid uh, of certain area called kibber kibber wildlife sanctuary in lahul spiti so set of uh, uh, the data set says that there are 314 species which are available you can just download this so this is a very good uh, resource uh, for everyone of course uh, uh, for many invertebrates it might not be having that much data but of course for uh, like for example cnidarians there are so much of data policies so many information is available on this data birds and mammals and to such full up the gbi repository is full up but uh, like for example uh, now uh, we have a national geological collection in jrsi and and then we thought that uh, why should this data should not be available in geospatial platform for doing research and investigations so uh, under the leadership of our able director we have started geospatial repository uh, maybe uh, maybe in this year by the end of this year we will be you know the entire spatial repository will be available for for researchers professional for doing research and uh, we have uh, this is an example how uh, you know uh, this is a dashboard of that geospatial repository portal here you can see that like for example uh, this is not full right uh, fully uh, uh, you know uploaded i just loaded on four or five lakh locations maybe in coming time we will be having so much of locations uh, where you finding out a gap is very difficult here you can see there are you just just uh, you know zoom into this you can further go to the location and then if you click any location you will get to know what species is there in this particular and when it is reported who has reported all that data set information is available then there is another polygon based data set which we have created uh, for the himalayan uh, vertebrates for the himalayan animals uh, where you can select the district boundary and you get a list of species like for example you selected this particular district uttarakhand so from the data set it is available that uh, it is uh, said that 1164 species are basically reported from uttarakhand and then the list is also be populated here after that so this uh, data set is also going to be available so i am saying that uh, i thought that let me present this also that uh, we should know that what kind of information is available with us in in the global uh, ecosystem as well as in india uh, which can be utilized for geospatial studies or for understanding the funnel funnel resources 
this is an example uh, basically uh, we have generated uh, we are in the process of generating vertebrate information on tehsil district pa maybe 10 climb 10 by 10 kilometer grids from this map it is quite evident that the mammalian diversity is higher in these areas throughout if we compare the entire space of the country these are for birds and fishes and so much of like that so we can create this kind of heat maps for different taxa also if you just go back to this particular grid uh, of dark blue color it is evident that 141 to 177 species mm -hmm. So uh, then uh, uh, geospatial uh, studies are also useful in understanding the impact of disasters. For example, tsunami, impact of tsunami on uh, a long-tailed macaque, which is distributed in Nicobar Islands. So we have studied that what was the situation in 2003 and what is the situation in 2014 after the tsunami. So there is a change in the distribution range. Here you can see that most of the this areas were having a lot of red colors, but now you do not find this red color is only on the periphery of this like that so that we can uh, we can document the changes what the natural disasters have resulted on the ecosystem and the species as i said that the other user is basically to understand the ecological landscape ecology of this species species uh, this is one species that myself and my colleague dr mukesh he's a molecular biologist we both of us are working in this particular area to study the uh, you know landscape ecology landscape genetics of this particular species what we found that uh, uh, the red panda, which is distributed in Singalila, uh, is not having linear connectivity the, with the other areas, like for example, Nigra Valley. What is interesting is that this species is coming like that. The distribution connectivity is like that. So we can know the corridors. We, there are areas in between uh, uh, Singalila and the Nigra Valley, which may not be having desired, you know, habitat requirements. So uh, if you just forget about this map, one will understand. One will think like that. Singalila might be having direct connectivity with uh, Nira Valley, but it's not like that. It is basically connected from the Sikkim Kanchenga landscape to the Pambunglo wildlife sanctuary, and then the species is percolated uh, to the Nira Valley area. So this is how this is the you know power of GIS remote sensing. I, I said that. Of course, this is useful and powerful, but the only thing is that one has to understand that what kind of information you have used. Uh, whether it is of that quality or not the otherwise it would be garbage in garbage out so one has to understand that what data has been used thank you very much uh, for listening to this uh, presentation thank you thank you very much dr lalit uh, for your very informative and uh, very basic to modern approaches of gis and remote sensing now i will request all the participant whoever is having any questions please go ahead unmute your mic one by one and you can ask directly to the expert and talk to them hello sir yeah please uh, hello sir uh, please can i audible please. sir yeah yeah yeah, 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 please yeah. Go uh, sir uh, in uh, in uh, in oceans how many depth uh, can uh, 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 photography is uh, possible with satellite image, sir, in sea, in in depth of the sea, sir. Yeah, about the remote sensing uh, aspect of uh, oceans, uh, actually, it, it, it is a very tricky question that you asked. Uh, uh, it is very difficult to <coughs> that, yeah, how much depth can be seen by remote sensing. It all depends ah, yes, upon the, you know, uh, what kind of environment is there in that particular area, whether the turbidity is very high or is not that turbid, or also the yeah. data set basically, like for example, European space agencies are also pro providing data sets at a very high level. And of course, that National Remote Sensing Agency is also providing data set at the you know, spatial resolution uh, five meters. So it's all depend upon the uh, the environment of that uh, you know ecosystem or maybe like you said that species. Of course, I have never worked on. Uh, it's very difficult to comment on that kind of data set. Uh, uh, what kind of uh, data? I mean, how much deeper we can see? But uh, there are a lot of publications which says that corals can be uh, nicely uh, you know uh, mapped using this. Uh, you might be knowing that. Okay. Of corals are modeled uh, using the remote sensing uh, data set. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you very much, sir. Uh, excuse me, Dr. Larry. I am uh, Dr. Satyanarayana, retired associate professor from the Wildlife Biology, ABC College, Tamil Nadu. 
uh, what are the when you have the remote sensing what about the effect of this rainy days if you have cyclone certain uh, the climatic factors what will be the remote sensing results sir you hear your voice sir after such a long time you are okay. a teacher of my teacher i know that yeah. <laughs> so you, you are a teacher of my teacher. good sir uh, uh, what i got from your question is that uh, uh, of course that remote sensing uh, uh, can be helpful uh, in projecting the climate change impact sir uh, because we, uh, all data set which are basically made available by the ipcc in the ar5 ar6 report uh, has been used globally and uh, it can be projected sir and uh, one more thing i would like to have it uh, you have just mentioned about climate change regard to some of the case studies like your reduced habitat related collective regard to the uh, langurs and the uh, brown bears yes. and uh, what is the period of duration of the uh, concern for the, for example the climatic change in relation to temperature maybe 10 years period or what is how we can relate with there is a certain uh, habitat changes whatever the uh, uh, the other variables also you consider when you have the climatic change what are the other yes. variables we have to consider there? So when you talk about the climatic change yeah sir uh, for projecting the climate change uh, there are basically bioclimatic data set which are basically made available by the ipcc uh, which is basically for uh, like for example 2030 2050 2070 this keep on changing and they provide data based on some certain uh, you know uh, climatic models which have been developed globally there are i think about 32 types of models and uh, uh, in our study we because uh, no particular model can be said that this is uh, very pertinent it can explain the thing but uh, of course we average all sort of uh, 32 models and we find out that the most commonly areas based on that climate change uh, data which cre was created and sir uh, the rest of the other parameter which are ecological like for example uh, the land use data like uh, that we have simulated for the future like you might be knowing sir uh, that uh, uh, there are land set data set which is available uh, uh, with the global uh, repositories there are uh, uh, modest data set like uh, at a resolution of 500 meters sir so for example if you have a data set of uh, like uh, 2010 and you have data set of 2020 and uh, uh, then you can project using this two data set uh, using some uh, you know variables uh, which for the 2030 the for simulated right. landscape can be created using that sir and then you can see yes. that how the species habitat suitability have changed based on the current data set you can go back to the past and also you can simulate the future sir this is globally accepted uh, strategies sir uh, there are uh, there are assumptions that we need to know that uh, if there is a increase of a 2 degree climate what will be the possible change on that particular grid like you might be knowing sir uh, uh, professor ravindranath from iisc bangalore has published a paper uh, which talks about the change the projected change in the forest the, the grid distribution so those those are basically simulations which are based on the existing knowledge how if there is will be a increase of this much temperature there will be increase of uh, this much precipitation or there will be fluctuation in the intensity of precipitation like for example the precipitation in area which uh, uh, occurs like for example 1000 mm but the intensity and the spread have changed it will going to impact the system so those things are basically uh, you know can be accounted using the mathematical algorithms and we can project this sir uh, i hope i have answered your question sir yeah very good. thank you thank, thank you thank you very much sir hello uh, dalit sir i have one question hello yes 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 hello sir, please tell me yeah, i have a double sir uh, yes 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 sir. Uh, sir sir i have a very one uh, uh, question is that regarding uh, human wildlife conflict sir so uh, how much authenticity you have uh, to running the model uh, with regarding to the changing behavior of the big cats in uh, regards of the conflict management nowadays in current scenario sir okay so as i said that uh, uh, it all depend upon the training data set that which you are giving to models for uh, for uh, you know predicting uh, uh, i don't know uh, whether you have come across about the climate uh, you know human wildlife conflict models there are so many uh, you know 
publications which are published on tigers and there are published on elephants and uh, leopards which have basically projected the uh, you know uh, human wildlife conflict areas this is basically based upon the knowledge which has been provided to the model if you have a better knowledge if you have understood any system for example one of my colleague called uh, uh, senior colleague called uh, harendra bargali he he has done a paper on uh, uh, you know tiger human in, in plus one i think in 2016 17 from uh, corbett tiger reserve what i saw that he has collected a historical data set of 10 to 15 years of conflict history in the area and using those conflict histories their situations what in what situation the particular area you know animal has resulted in conflict with humans like the distance of the forest and the requirement of the area and based on that he have predicted the hot spots that this is the area which is going to have a uh, higher number of conflict cases in the coming future just because there are similarity examples like for example if i live in certain area uh, if you just want to project my suitability my uh, probability of uh, occurrence you can just just uh, you need to uh, study my history like wherever i am going what are my ways of communication and how i you know transport and if you know all those things you can project it and uh, because uh, it is mathematical mathematically possible to do that and uh, uh, then i saw this particular example uh, while while i was reading uh, bergley uh, dr bergley's paper i saw that human uh, you know uh, forest fire is also an important problem in this area one of my student or a junior colleague uh, from fri he was working on forest fire in this area so what i saw that what dr bergley has predicted that this is the area which one fake this is a, that the same area is going to have a lot of forest fires so there may be some relationship with forest fire also when there is a fire the animal will move out so government has to look into that so uh, i actually don't remember your name uh, but i Dr. i Sanjeev, think i have answered your answer yeah up to certain extent sir thank you thank you very much hello good evening sir sir is pranay from iit gandhinagar i just want to ask about the uh, your approach for ecosystem uh, approach for climate change studies sir could you highlight something about that thank you so uh, pranje good to hear you uh, okay. i would say that uh, uh, i am as such i am not working on ecosystems to model it but uh, uh, yes, i am more focused to our animals uh, i study animals like for example recently i am taking up a project one of my student is working on how the composition of animals is going to change in a, in a in a you know uh, in a particular elevation gradient of himalayas like for example ecotones uh, you might be knowing there are uh, if you go to the himalayas there are subalpine areas where uh, where a lot of species are there this is a area where uh, you know there are tree lines and after that there is there is no particular for the trees so what is yeah. happening what we found and uh, based on that i would i'm just trying to relate uh, pranja this with an ecosystem that uh, what i found that uh, uh, you know there are several species of animals as well as plants which are which are crowding in that particular elevation and those species are large you know journalist species uh, but there are certain species as i give an example of brown bear which are very specialist which are going to you know uh, going to going going moving moving further but to the, to the higher elevations but at an ecosystem level uh, i am just trying to uh, you know uh, coming out with a uh, publication and how the himalayan ecosystem are uh, going to be changed in terms of animals as well as plants it's not only one species or two species i am making a multi species model to understand that change in composition of the entire faunal as well as uh, you know floral element of the area but of course okay. i know you that being in a forestry student you might be more interested how the ecosystem services and function are going to be impacted there are examples simulation examples are available uh, which can be modeled but only thing pranja is that that you need to you need to be very precise in selecting parameters which can explain because what all the output that you are going to get is basically the product of that uh, you know training data set which you have, uh, by which you have trained your computers your algorithm which is working on okay sir 
थैंक यू थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू थैंक यू सो मच गुड आफ्टरनून सर आई एम रितु चक्रवर्ती सर आई एम ऑडिबल सर यस यस ओके uh so i'm mudita chakraborty i'm a scholar of kalyani university i am a former scholar of zoological survey of india uh, thank you for a wonderful lecture uh, so i have a question that uh, what are the basic parameters for selecting the grid based analysis like you have shown uh, that the grid based analysis for the survey what are the basic parameter we should follow for that for those analysis thank you sir okay Odip, so uh, for deciding a, a, a grid, it is uh, the most important parameter. Uh, let me tell you before going into the grid that you should know what species you are going to study. Like for example, you you want to study some large cat, or you want to study some bear, or maybe some uh, some other species. All depends upon for animals. I am telling you right now, all depends upon the home range size of that particular species. if you if you know the animal uh, which is having a home range of 100 square kilometer then you can fix a grid of 10 by 10 kilometer for your studying uh, for your study this is basically uh, these grids are not only uh, uh, designed for distribution modeling studies you can also fix the grid size based upon the availability of resources and based upon uh, your you know tenure the how long you are going to uh, work in this particular area like for example tigers uh, people are you know putting uh, i have seen examples from ranthambore tiger reserve where you know camera traps have been used by 2 by 2 km grid but there are uh, if you go back to the entire you know in, in national tiger uh, census the grid size is little bigger that all depend upon like for example snow leopards it is used by a uh, lot of organizations at the scale of 4 by 4 km that all depend upon the home range size the availability of resources then third thing is basically the how much time you are going to invest in that whether you have that much effort time uh, allocated for doing your study or not thank you I thank you very much sir. thank you yes sir you have cleared my doubt sir so. thank you sir so this is aman from farai yes aman Yes, Aman. Please tell. Hello. Hello. Yes, yeah, Aman. Please tell. Go ahead. Please Hello. Go good ahead. evening, sir. Hello. I can hear you. Yeah. Please go ahead. Hello. Yeah. Aman, you are good to go. Sir, this is Aman from. F this is Aman, Aman from Farai. Aman, you are good to go. Yes, sir. Sir, yes. I have one question, sir. How can we check? Yes, sir. sir. How can we uh, reduce or check the over prediction of model? Yeah, Aman, uh, good to hear you after such a long time. It looks, uh, Neil Mahapatra, sir. I just want to say that I, I it looks like that most of my uh, known people are actually attending the uh, interaction. Anyway, sir. So, Aman, let me tell you that uh, uh, when we do the species distribution modeling. Uh, if you remember in one of my slide i said that there are nowadays assembled ensemble models are available what basically we do uh, we create models uh, different uh, based on different algorithms and then we create an ensemble of that so the area which is commonly predicted by all of these commonly predicted by all of these 5 4 5 6 models we consider that this is the area which is not over predicted means this is not false positive if you just uh, model using maxent or maybe some uh, random forest algorithm maybe using the glm or maybe some other an nfa uh, model you will see the different outputs different outputs will be visible in front of you so for mitigating that you know how to reduce this uh, over prediction one has to model the distribution using the what do you call ensemble of this so if you just go to the slide here i just want to show you uh, there is a slide where i said that there are and this is an ensemble output yes see if you see there are ensemble counts there are 1 2 3 4 so if i say that ensemble count 4 means there are the red color area are the one which are basically predicted by all four models so what is available in 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 the form of one it is not very very much suitable 
Understood? Aman, are you there? So what is available in green color is is basically is is not that uh, that's suitable. So you can say that only one model is predicting this. It may be this may be over prediction for a model, but if you create ensemble or of all of the four models, you may see that the red color area is the one which is very precisely estimated. This is not over predicted. Very precisely, uh, you know, predicted by the model uh, using uh, the the suitable uh, suitable characteristics which you have provided to the algorithm while doing the modeling. Aman, I I hope I have answered your question. And if you have any problem, you can interact with me. Later on. Hmm. Okay, thank you, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Hello. Hello, ha, Madam, I'll tell you. Yes, sir. मैं अभी एक मीटिंग में हूं जस्ट अभी मैं कॉल करता हूं बैक आपको हाँ, हाँ. एनी मोर क्वेश्चन और आई गो टू द चैट बॉक्स फॉर सम क्वेश्चन गुड इवनिंग ऑडिबल Uh, so what are the major constraints in the mode sensing studies uh, on frontal conversation especially the canopy and uh, the size of the species are concerned and uh, other other doubts see any studies on biological inversion by using the multi resolution remote sensing methods uh, sir i could not able to understand your second question can you please repeat again or let me answer first question Yes, uh, you were trying to understand how the modeling uh, can be done uh, for different taxa, like for example, canopy species. I'm right, or can you, can you please uh, correct me? Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. It's true. Yeah. yeah. So the canopy, the canopy, as I said, that sir, is all depend upon the training data set. If you have a good quality training data set and the variables that you have, like for example, sir, let me tell you. about one of my study which i did on for hangul's as i said that in my presentation the distribution of the entire range of the species is less than 1000 square kilometer so globally no data set is available uh, which can be utilized for uh, that uh, you know small range species so what i did that i created my own data set for that area for example i have used the list for data or list list for data for creating the land cover use of the area so the spatial resolution of that particular data is 5 uh, 5 km so i know that pixels that pixel size that uh, of that much uh, 5 meter can i can classify that so the resolution is further can go to uh, go down to 1 km also that all depend upon the data set like for example european space agency is providing the wild view two data which is having a spatial resolution of 1 km size of that so that all depend upon what particular species you are working on like for example canopy dwellers or canopy species you can model that also sir that all depend upon uh, how much area you are basically using uh, like for example if you are working in a very dense kind of forest like in western ghats uh, defining the pixels you know training your uh, computer data set training your computer is really going to be tough because you know it becomes very difficult to uh, you know say this yes or no making the data you know uh, in in binomial for a mathematical program so but but you can do that that you can do a nested classification strategy you can use a nested one where you can classify uh, you can uh, you know make the suitability at different spatial resolutions means different uh, uh, spatial scales so if you have a finer scale distribution modeling for one taxa like for example in some protected uh, area or in some uh, range of any protected area or in any compartment of any protected area if you can model and based on that model you can identify the cerebrates means like for example there are parameters which which are very difficult to uh, identify that whether this parameter is influencing or not but in the meantime there are cerebrates means uh, there are certain parameters which which may be having similarity with your parameter which is influencing the species 
but you have that one the other one you do not have the parameter which is very pertinent to the species so you can use the surrogate parameters so using that sir you can definitely uh, make the distribution assessment at a finer scale and based on the final scale you can further increase your scale depend upon your uh, requirement of your analysis i hope i have answered the first question can you please ask me the second question sir what about the say the major menace in the wildlife sanctuary of course it is the alien species alien species or exotic species sir alien species or the yeah, exotic yeah. species major threat what about the extent of uh, biological innovation studies by using remote sensing methods in india there can be yes, breeding the are so many yeah so i'll tell you there are so many studies which are uh, so many pro professionals uh, which are working on the invasive species infestation uh, i will just give you the most recent example uh, there is a group in wildlife center of india under the leadership of dr jhala he have recently published a paper on uh, lantana invasion of uh, in the entire country he have data for the entire country of lantana means he can do that because he has done some surveys uh throughout the country so there are other professionals uh, from northeastern states uh, northeastern state universities are there in, which have also worked on the invasive species infestation uh, there is iit kharagpur they have also worked on invasive species uh, infestation under the leadership of dr bera and the irs deradin also there are so many groups which are working on invasive species infestation uh, i will give you another example for animals uh, although it is not an invasive species infestation but again the species which is not good for the local you know the native species is an example uh, is feral feral dogs in trans himalayan regions these feral dogs are you know uh, in getting uh, creating a lot of havoc in this area they are you know killing a lot of wild animals so this is a kind of infestation only so we are studying uh, how the feral dogs are basically uh influencing this very soon we are going to have publication on this and how much area is going to be you know under the influence of feral dogs which is very critical for the conservation and management of this species and under the agriculture sector also sir there are a lot of uh, examples which are uh, prominently available uh, uh, which are uh, published also uh, in forestry lantana as well as the machenia in the himalayan region uh, certainly they have been published but in aquatic ecosystem uh, this kind of infestation are not that much published in india there is a lot of scope uh, for uh, understanding the you know infestation of a uh, lot of catfish uh, catfishes in the uh, aquatic ecosystems how they are infestating the system but that area also had to be studied sir i hope i have answered your question sir okay sir thank you thank you very much sir wonderful presentation thank you sir I hope we will take now the uh, questions in the chat box. Uh, so, yes, on behalf of the participant, I am asking you the questions. Mr. Vishwajit yes, Ponda asks that is JDSI is providing uh, GIS workshop? Uh, GIS workshops? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, Mr. Vishwajit, let me tell you that uh, last year also we did some workshop. and of course uh, if you are, we have an annual program bus now unfortunately because of the covid everything is now uh, uh, on hold uh, let us see when uh, you keep checking uh, uh, our portals we have a set of uh, uh, you know uh, programs that we organize very frequently and uh, you can keep in touch with uh, anil sir he can tell you that whenever uh, you know new training will be organized in gis remote sensing you can definitely apply for that and dr gomathi k from hyderabad she asked how far uh, this remote sensing techniques can be useful detecting invasive uh, invasion of some exotic species a uh, very right question uh, i would say that is pretty pretty useful i would say that gis remote sensing is pretty useful in detecting that and uh, uh, in the previous answer to i forget the professor who was asking me uh i i think i have answered that uh, there are lot of publications which have recently come up which have talked about the uh, infestations the most classical one is the, the dr jhalwas publication on lantana because he is the one who have the data for the entire almost for the entire country 
so it all depends upon the data set which is basically used for training the computer algorithm if you have a good data to train it definitely you are going to get good output and uh, i think it is doable it is it is i think it's not like that in, in, in this infestation cannot be traced on or mapped like that uh, there is another question from anvesha mukherji can we use gis remote sensing in conservation of vulture species of course uh, there are examples for that also i will say that uh, uh, you know for vultures uh, uh, it all depend it all depend upon the ecological requirements of the species like for example if you know that vultures lives in this particular kind of habitats their requirements are like this they depends upon this kind of food resources and that is all on the land maybe like that maybe some uh, arboreal species vulture prefer but there are a lot of uh, arboreal you know land resources which the vultures are using so you know that based on the knowledge that vultures are available in that kind of elevation that kind of climate because there is a climatic isotherm means there is a climatic umbrella which is required for sustaining the population of any species if you could able to trace that that this is the maximum extent of the climatic umbrella or climatic isotherm of any species you can predict the find out find out the other areas which are there in the entire you know the area of probability of occurrence of other areas which are having similar conditions if you if you can say that that based on the knowledge you can predict it and then what you have to do that you have to validate it like uh, whatever prediction that you have made then you can check uh, you can check your uh, projections using the training data set you like for example you have 100 gps location for a vulture and you use 70 gps location for making the model and the rest of the 13 gps location can be used for testing the model the locations which are uh, which where you found the species if these locations are falling in the area which is project projected by the uh, your model it tells you that how accurate you are out of 30, 70 locations if there are uh, out of 30 locations if 25 locations are falling in this area you'll say that model is let like 95 percent or more than 95 percent accurate so it is projectable all depend upon the data uh, which basically is used for you know uh, projecting the uh, distribution or identifying the suitable areas and of course the once you know the suitable areas you can prioritize your conservation activities so it can directly relate to the conservation of any species uh, one very good question by swagatika panigrahi she asks sir my query is does this techniques help in differentiate the cryptic species in a habitat <laughs> it is really <laughs> It is really very difficult to do to do that. You cannot uh, uh, cryptic species. You cannot identify using the spatial modeling. Of course, you can uh, you can identify the areas which are having uh, similar similarities to the species which you have studied. Like for example, if you know that leopards are distributed in this area, so you if you know that leopard requirement then you can assume that the area, the species which are basically the prey species of leopards if they are if leopard is there it means that the, you may expect the prey species also so that kind of a, you know ecologically related species can be identified but cryptic species sometimes it difficult to identify using the microscope you forget about monitoring the <laughs> those kind of organisms from space thank you sagatika Really, it's an area to think by us. <laughs> no, it's a task now to you. <laughs> How to go with this yes, problem? And uh, Mr. Prathamesh, yeah, a asked, good idea to think of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a gap area, I can say. Prathamesh, he is asking, "Hello, sir. I am Prathamesh Srisad, MSc Wildlife Biology. After MSc in Wildlife Biology, the beginner want to work with you in Himalayas." how we will contact you or apply you on for your ongoing project because all openings needs experience in himalayan fields yeah so you 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 what you can do you just contact Daniel sir you just uh, take my email id from him and you can join us an intern if you are that interested to work in himalayas i am open for uh, taking interns right now it's not a problem yeah. It all depends yeah. upon if you are a wildlifer, then definitely the opportunities are there. 
I hope I hope we have uh, taken all the questions and uh, thank you very much for his uh, answering Prathamesh question uh, for taking the freshers as intern because uh, the purpose of this meet the expert um, and let us discuss biodiversity forum is that to encourage more students towards these fields of biodiversity or related fields and uh, thank you very much Dr. Lalit uh, for your very excellent presentation and answering almost all the questions with patients. I'm really thankful to you and I'm thankful to our Honorable Director, Dr. Kailash Chandra Sara also for permitting us uh, to arrange this and um, inviting all the experts from JDC and outside to this forum. I thank all the participants for active participation and uh, thank you all. Have a good day. Thank you, Dr. Lalit. Special thanks to you for your kind patience. Thank you very much, sir, for, for giving me the opportunity. Uh, I, I I just want to say at the end that uh, definitely, sir, you can ask this anybody who's interested to work as an intern in my lab. It would be very good, sir. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lali. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.